Welcome to the Berks Homes Podcast. I'm Katie and I'm here with my brother Ben. And today we are going to be talking about our guiding principles. Last time we spoke, well, it wasn't the last time, it was probably our intro episode. Mm -hmm. We kind of went over what our guiding principles are. And we've had some great feedback so far about some topics and things. And since guiding principles are the second half of what our foundation of our company is built on, we thought we would go into a little more detail about how we came up with them and how we use them. So let's talk about what your experience was with the guiding principles, because these started well before we came up with this one sheet of paper. So I have... 20 years of history with some of these words on here, some of the concepts. And I know that you kind of were in and out of some of those conversations. Right. Yeah. I was, I was out doing remodeling, but we had from the beginning, I want to say it was like 2000, 2001 ish. We landed on the core values, right? Yeah. Well, it started, those conversations were started. I think it was really when we read Good to Great. Yeah. And I think Deb I'm, has the date written down in her book. I think maybe early, 2005. Early 2000s. Yeah. So I think what we wanted to do with the guiding principles and, and especially the core values was pare them down. We had eight. eight. And so I think we did a really good job. And this took how long? Honestly, we were working on it for a good four years on and off before we landed on how to condense into one sheet. Yes. I think that, you know, personally well i'll speak for you too these the core values especially talking about them first you know there's those are all things that were strong themes in the parenting style yes and and it's reflected in just the way dad especially handles himself on a daily basis with everybody that he comes into contact with i think what we tried to do was not just from a personal standpoint, but what, you know, what the values were for the company as it evolved. And it just, everybody that was in a leadership position or even, you know, anybody that was hired, it was not intentional. You know, we didn't screen that way, but it was subliminally. It, it like is attracted to like. So we naturally gravitated to people that shared our same values, but we didn't have it documented. So when we created the eight originally 20 years ago, we polled the entire company. Mm -hmm. So we sent out a survey. They everyone sent in descriptions, like descriptors of what our culture was. Right. And we kind of pulled that group of information together and picked out the themes of it and put words and names to it. So it ended up with eight kind mm-hmm. of, it wasn't just one word things yeah, either. Were it was like, yeah, Men. right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, deliver the wow. You know, there was just, it was more phrases. Right. And what was really great to see all those survey results come in to see that everybody was really aligned. Mm. You know, there was a lot of consistent themes of, you know, family, helpful, just like everyone is aligned and on the same page about how to treat each other. It was a lot of reinforcement that we were on the same page culturally. Yeah. And so nothing has had really changed since we did that initial, you know, questionnaire to everyone. Right. But what we wanted to do was make it even more powerful by combining some of those concepts and we kind of ended up on I think helpful humble and driven Mm -hmm. and then the last we knew that we were missing a piece because a lot of the time when you don't have all four of these you're unbalanced so we needed that last one to be a balance because you if you are just driven without awareness sometimes you can be a little aggressive and like a locomotive yes and you know if you're just helpful without the driven or the awareness you know so you you need to, to have a nice balance so that aware word came in from a book Mike read it has to be a Lencioni or yeah. oh, man I'm sorry Mike I can't remember <laughs> off the top of my yeah. head but it, it basically was the moment to say oh we're missing that one piece that's more of the internal balance to the drive yes and and the people 
in the building or buildings that execute that word aware very well are always the people that their coworkers turn to in situations where they need an arbiter and like that. Yeah. So these are people that naturally, if you're aware, I mean, I'll, I'll read the definition actually. Oh yeah. So we have the words and then what it means, how to express it, and then the end result. So for aware, it means you're able to read the room and diving deeper into that. It's a skill set. I would go back to dad being, you know, kind of like the the bar setter for all of these. Mm -hmm. When you read the room, it means, is this the time and place to present this? You know, if tensions are high, you don't, you're not going to throw gasoline on the fire. Is this, is this the time and place? Is this the right venue? Are these the right people to discuss this? Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's, how is this person going to receive this information? Not just in the time and place, but their personality. Right. The context of the situation, meaning how you deliver something and how somebody receives it. Right. Right. So we'll use along with this, we have our personality um, motivations, which we've really integrated into not just hiring, but, you know, how to communicate with each other Mm -hmm. when we're different. Yeah. So I'll give an example for me is your high performance. Yes. And so if I come at a situation with you and I want to talk about basically people involved in something, Mm -hmm. but I don't talk about performance or result or result result. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's not going to land as well. I'm just talking about stuff that is not at the top of your list, Mm -hmm. you know? So reading the room is knowing I need to curate my communication style Mm -hmm. on the person exactly and that's it's not some people have it like you're just born with like i know how to communicate with different types of people others it needs to be a skill that they acquire and refine Mm -hmm. over time so i think like you said when you're balanced that's one of those critical things so Mm -hmm. people that come in and are what we call red you Mm -hmm. know results based that could be a challenge for them. Yeah, typically, like for me being a red, I really had to tap into being aware. And honestly, the humble piece as well, because Mm -hmm. if you're driving for results all the time, you know, setting aside the ego is not that. It's not always that, but it's, it's kind of like setting aside some of the you know, attack that you, you, you have internally to make things happen because you want something done now. Well, not everything is about me and what I want to get done. It's not about the results all the time. So calm down, ask good questions, yeah. you know. So actually, that's probably the next one to go into since I'm I'm revealing yeah. it. So how, how to express it is ask good questions and stay engaged. So This is awareness, going back to aware. Using your red profile as the example, not that, you know, you, for instance, you you manage your your red very well. You know, I was taught behavior. Sure, sure. But it could be presented as this opinion, my idea is is the only one or the most important. Mm -hmm. Right. So reading the room is saying I need to adjust probably the tone or you know the messaging in my communication because in reality it's the most important to you right not always the most important to other people to the room exactly yeah, so you're trying to roll something out that is going to get the results that we want and then there's three blues who care about people mm-hmm. more than anything they're motivated by people they say well but that affects people in these five ways and right so if if you're really working on your awareness you come to the table with a solution that outlines how it affects people as well yes even though it's not maybe your first motivation Mm -hmm. but then that satisfies that then you have the green people that care about process how exactly it gets done not necessarily how it affects people or the results, 
but that it should be done a certain way, and then the other two things don't matter. So it, it's it's all this this harmonious, you know, circular reference of trying to basically get in the middle. Well, and and I guess if we take a step back, the whole purpose of the guiding principles is to give you a framework to answer most questions that you have of how to operate. Yeah. So step number one is know thyself. Mm. Become self-aware. Okay, who am I? That's why we give those tests so that you can understand your own motivators. That's why we go into a lot of different personality tests on top of it as needed. So if you understand yourself, you understand how you're motivated, then you know how to work the guiding principles. Right. So using the aware example, you know what your motivations are. You understand what other people's in the room is you know how to use aware to your benefit and everyone else's yeah so that's kind of the you know high level look at guiding principles is when in doubt default to using this as a tool to you know be successful in your job at the end of the day yeah you know so if we start with the core values, you know, we're kind of starting with the internal piece a little bit, the human part. If you get those working in your favor, then you'll be able to fill our mission and vision. Correct. So that's kind of why, as we're talking, we're starting with the core values to say, understand yourself, understand how to be effective using those core values, and then we'll get into the rest of the stuff. Starts at the individual level. Yes. And, you know, stepping back one more further, we're going to almost look at this like a lens, how we hire, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and Mm -hmm. we've been doing it a long time. Mm -hmm. Now we just have, over the last, you know, four or five years, just a standard framework to, you know, really talk to people Mm -hmm. on the interview process, the phone screening, all of that. The phone screener, the, the recruiter, they'll actually, you know, filter specifically in their mind, like... It, does this person sound aware, person sound helpful, humble, those things? And I think that's the first piece. And then as you are, you know, oriented here, you're onboarded, then it's how do I operate? Yes. You know, moving forward. Let me just finish the aware yep. part. So the result of being aware in all your interactions is anticipating the impact of your actions. And I think that is... That, that just cuts right to the bone of the, mm-hmm. the whole word. And basically it's saying before I interact, be with a coworker, you know, a vendor, a customer, anything, I'm going to think about how my messaging is and saying if I say it this way, this could be the result. If I say it this way, that could be the result, right? Yes. So. And I'd like to tie back every core value to the mission yeah. and vision, mm-hmm. basically to say, okay, if we anticipate the impact of our actions, are we hitting our mission, mm-hmm. which is we create the lasting relationships. We create lasting relationships by earning the trust of those we serve. Mm-hmm. So are we, if we are anticipating the impact of our actions, ultimately building trust? That's the end game. So the result of each of our core values is to build trust in relationship. So we believe that these four core values help you create trust in relationship. Right. Period. So moving in, we kind of hit with aware the most difficult one, in my opinion. It is. Because it's it's most, it's like the most complicated and the most subtle almost it's navigating office politics it's it's interpersonal relationships it's the most difficult one when you're working with people yes yeah because you can pick up anybody off the street and say they're helpful you know Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's a manner that's that's what people are raised to be generally helpful Mm -hmm. and but aware is a skill Yes. More. That's kind of where what we've understood working with these for a while is helpful, humble and driven are more just you're born with it. Yeah. Typically one of them or a couple yeah. and then aware is is a learned behavior. Nurture. Yeah. So if we go back to the core values helpful, what it means proactively be 
of use and service, Mm -hmm. how to express it, pitch in, and the result, we leave things better than we found them. And I would say this is the most prevalent core value in our company. I, I feel like almost anyone that walks in the door is just built this way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably why it's first. I think you're right. Yeah. We we want to perpetuate. We have the culture of being helpful, but we want it to to be perpetuated in, you know, the rest of time because at at our core, we feel like we want to be a team. If if you can rely on everybody around you to keep their eyes open. Yeah. You know, and I mean it's kind of like awareness, but mm-hmm. it's always looking out for opportunities to help your coworkers. Pitch in. And it's not coworkers, it's everybody. Sure. You know, it's trades, vendors, yeah. customers. It's just being able to always look at a situation and be like, I can I can add value here and nobody's ever gonna say that they're they went on a vacation and had things fall apart. Oh, right, right. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they're probably not even required to be proactive in most situations. Mm-hmm. Their coworker will say, oh, yeah, I was going to take care of that. No worries. Yeah, that's exactly and, right. Yeah, we probably don't have to spend a lot of time on helpful. Cause it's just kind of an obvious one. But Yeah, what is, again, nice tying it back to the mission. That's a huge one to build trust and relationships. Mm-hmm. Being yes. helpful, helping each other out. Yeah, and we, we really look at that in terms of, you know, creating trust we're we're in it for the long haul. Yeah. We want to establish new relationships on a daily basis mm-hmm. with people that we're going to have for a long time. Exactly. Employees, vendors, customers, all of that. Yep. That's the long term. And so if it means sacrificing now yeah. for that end game, mm-hmm. we're willing to do that. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. yeah. So humble. I'll take humble. This is one that could be a little unique to our organization just because of, I would say, probably because of dad. Mm -hmm. It was critical for us to, you know, work this into the main core values because we feel like out of humility comes so many great results. That's exactly right. In reality, tying it back to the mission, everybody that, you know, looks at a person that has that distinct value of humility, they're automatically going to assign some level of trust to them. Yes. When you meet somebody that's humble and, you know, somebody maybe successful, really successful, and you're the first thing you say if if you meet somebody successful mm-hmm. and they impress you as somebody that's really humble, that's the first thing they're going to say because automatically you meet somebody that's really successful, you say, wow you know, they must have an ego. Of course. And then the first thing you say is, couldn't believe how down to earth they are. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it does, it's just, how many times have you heard that in your Mm -hmm. life? And so I think no matter what, you never want to get too high or too low. Mm -hmm. It's that internal confidence of, you know, having humility and being part of something greater than you. Yes. And that's the beauty of the detail here. Yeah. So uh, what it means, have gratitude, set a, set aside ego, uh, how to express it, be curious about others, listen and let them shine, accept al- accolades with grace. And then the result is we prioritize team wins. All that stuff is so good. You know, I, I just love all of it. I think what I really like about what it means is saying that you're practicing gratitude on mm-hmm. a daily basis. Yes. It's my favorite part. You know, it just makes you uh, have a much larger worldview. It's such perspective. You're just, you know, grateful for the little things. And it's it's a lot more about we than I. Mm -hmm. Because if you're grateful, you're just thinking about all these things around you. You're not telling yourself, I'm so grateful that I'm so great. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, this is my favorite core value because... I feel like there's so much opportunity to express it. Well, and then the interesting exercise that we went through in creating the descriptors was how to balance the idea that the kind of old school thought of being humble, which means like maybe at first glance you think, oh, okay, well, that means I can't talk about 
myself or we can't, you know, in this day of day and age of social media, mm. talk about ourselves and our successes and things. And and we wanted to make sure that it, it's not saying be quiet and don't celebrate wins. Right. The idea and the thing that I love is that we prioritize team wins. We're we're just saying make sure that you bring in all of the pieces that made something a success, not just your contribution, just what the whole formula was. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we can't celebrate when we win. I right. mean, absolutely. That's what we're here for. You know, we're we're trying to win. Now that's the red in me coming sure. out. But the idea is Usually you're going to have to have a whole lot of resources, a lot of help to actually make it happen. So just make sure that you bring that in the celebration. I mean, who wants to celebrate with themselves? Right. I mean, seriously, it's, <laughs> that's no fun. Right. It's just like giving. It's generally better, more rewarding to somebody when they're able to give a really good gift that lands with somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, then getting it. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it all goes together and it's just so much more enjoyable, impactful and makes the team, you know, a, a lot more harmonious when you're all celebrating together. That's exactly right. And in reality, business, there's no one person ever. It <laughs> yeah. doesn't matter. I yeah. mean, you, you just... You're not going to be successful if it's all the success is derived from one or two or three people. It mm -hmm. just doesn't happen. That's not what we're trying to build anyway. No, we're exactly. trying to build you know something that lasts. So yeah. So then that the last of the core values is driven. This driven is probably where I land more than anything else. What it means: passionately motivated to achieve lofty goals. How to express it be tenacious and exceed expectations and the result we are never satisfied with the status quo i really like this one because it's a constant reminder to besides being passionately motivated you know the how to express it i really like because it's a reminder to assume you will fail mm -hmm. that's the be tenacious part you're going to hit failures but get back up again and then keep going until you exceed those expectations. Yeah. And there's a lot that's implied in these words, but that's kind of why we're talking about it is to, to put more definition behind it. So that's a huge part of our business that I don't know if we talk about a lot is the acceptance and expectation of failure. Right. The yeah. I, that That's part of who we are. People don't get in trouble if they mess something up. It's about the effort more than anything else and the intention and what you do with it when you fail. Well, and the learning that mm -hmm. you get out of it. Right. So you put in the effort. It didn't work out the way you wanted it to. What did you learn? What are you going to try again next time? Yeah. And keep going until you get the desired or exceeded result. Correct. So it's never a waste for a mistake if you get something out of it because that's where innovation happens. That's where you have the opportunity to tap in your team, you know. New perspectives. Yeah. There is just ideas. so much, so many great things that can come out of that drive and that acceptance to fail. Yeah, we're probably not talking about it enough. You're right. And I think that there there's probably a lot of people who have come from a different organization or there's organizations out there where failing is is a negative and it's it's considered incompetence mm. or it's considered to be subpar performance and that that couldn't be further from the truth here right and and you're right we we probably need to you know land on that more often in the sense of you can still fail and and abide by these core values. Exactly. You can you can do it the right way and the result might not be where we want it to be. Yeah. And I think that this was another one that that needed to be introduced because of the helpful and humble. Yes. It's like yeah, we we're not going to achieve exceptional results if we just have like a lot of nice people. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. We want to have nice people that like to do a lot and, yeah. and win. They like to win. <laughs> and it's possible. It 
it's not everybody. Yeah. You can't always just bring in high performers that stomp everybody around them. Yes. You know, there's plenty of driven people out there, mm -hmm. but we want to win the right way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's possible. Yeah. Probably the mainstream media or the world at large doesn't uh, look at it like that. Good guys finish last, all mm -hmm. that stuff. And Couldn't it's just disagree not, more. <laughs> yeah, it's just not true. Mm -hmm. You will lose battles because there are situations where, you know, we have a hundred of these, but, you know, you let the, the, the guy with the big ego stomp on you. I'm talking about outside relationships, sure. you know, with, with, uh, with people who need to win every engagement mm -hmm. and you might you might let them win it might cost you a little bit of money but you know who's going to crawl back to you when they're in a tough spot exactly is that guy mm -hmm. so i can rely on these people we're so fair in, in our interaction yeah that's again tying back to the mission yeah building trust right you know it's it's making sure that in our drive that we have that mission still at the forefront of our minds right that the re end result we're trying to get the drive that we're pushing towards is building keeping and earning the trust of those we serve right and you who know? in your mind who are those we serve just to give everybody context oh that's a great question so i uh, i would say it's employees customers and partners and partners to me the definition would be anyone we work with, whether it's financial, it's trade partners, it's suppliers, it's land relationships, any of the, those are those we serve. Right. Even people we buy software from. Absolutely. That we interact with once a month. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that is on the other end of a phone call or Zoom or whatever, those are the people we serve. That's exactly anybody. right. Anybody. When they have an interaction with, with our company, we want it to be all the same way yes and they get that feeling yep and that's kind of the point of my department the experience Anything department that yes. you experience from burke's homes should be consistent across the board and i guess we we need to hit on vision here lastly be a major league player in minor league markets which is so fun to talk about because it what that this i think may have been the most natural and easy phrase that we came up with on the whole page yeah we had been kind of saying it and then all of a sudden it clicked like oh this is this is our vision this is when we look ahead this is who we are we want to step up our game we want to be a major league player meaning we want to play with the elite mm -hmm. out there we want to have the best cost control the best customer experience, the best processes, systems, efficiencies, the best numbers on all of our scorecards, yeah. you know, major league player. But we are serving minor league markets and we're staying out of the way mm -hmm. of all of those other people who are playing in the major leagues. Right. We're not going to go open uh, an office in Atlanta. No, nope. no, 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 no. We want to be... and and. Just as an aside, the, the minor league market thing kind of came to fruition when you looked at where we build, and there's always minor league teams. Minor league baseball teams yeah. that are just thriving in every one of our, you know, home bases yeah. where we have regions. Yeah, mm -hmm. not major league teams, minor, minor league, league teams. Yep. And so it, it encapsulates, you know, the end goal of what we're trying to do, which is be the very best, the be the big fish in the small pond. Yes. And I think I think we've we've done a lot of play on words with the baseball stuff, mm -hmm. which is really good for those of us that need visuals. Right. You know, to a see a story to tie it yeah, back to. Yeah. And I think I think it's really served us well because we can we can confidently say right now that moving forward the next 10 years, you know, our 10 year includes additional markets. We, we know what they are already without yep. knowing specifically what they are. It's going to have the same product mix. It's going to have the same target market. It's going to have the same trade base. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same feel 
in any pocket in America that we go to. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good summary. I mean, I'm sure at some point, perhaps we can get dad to articulate in words what it means to him. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. I would love (laughs) to actually have Mike and dad talk about how the the journey of of bringing this together you know because they they had a lot of conversations as well yeah to make this it's amazing how much work was involved with that piece of paper oh, yeah. yeah shout out to Lori Gleva for guiding principles by the way yeah she yeah. was the one that came up with the name oh, that's great yeah let's see the next p okay guiding principles so any questions just let us know you yeah. know tell okay. us if we missed anything yeah. too we need to talk about MVP MVP. Employee shout out. Okay, today is going to be an easy one, but it's it's one that almost everybody listening will identify with. It is the one and only John D'Angelo. Okay, tell me more. So it's hard in picking an MVP as we discussed because everybody does such great work, but we felt like it was important to, moving forward, highlight one person. And... John D'Angelo can get overlooked because he's always kind of the go-to guy when you talk about core values. Mm. And, you know, if you pick one person that has been here a long time, he's at least the most identifiable because Mm. everybody knows John. Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of employees who've been here a long time, but... You know, he's he's the John DTV. He's out there. People know who he is. Mm -hmm. John does so many little things on a daily basis to improve morale, connect people with the right resource. And he's he's so helpful. Yeah. And he cares so much about the success of the organization that. You know, to a fault. Yeah, I mean... He, Poor guy, don't stress out, man. Yeah, it's okay. We got you. <laughs> always saying, even if you let me go, <laughs> I will die as a Burks Homes employee, <laughs> which is kind of psychotic, uh. but that's who he is. And he's a great friend of ours. He's like a family. He's like our brother. And he's doing a lot of great things actually in work as well. I mean, that he right now he's rolling out a bunch of new initiatives to the field and he's just the heartbeat of the construction operation. And so he's my shout out. You know, I feel like we got to start the new year with John. Well, it's very fitting on the Guiding Principles episode is is to give John D that shout out. That's perfect. Yep. He hits all four quadrants on a daily basis. That's exactly right. The last thing that we want to touch on is a challenge. I did commit to starting a book and I and I did that. I actually have two books that I started you know one is because I am watching the wheel of time mm-hmm. on Amazon Prime right now oh really <laughs> it's not not anything that you not me want to no. watch no or no. books that you want to read it's great yeah. series if you're into that thing and another one called switch by Dan oh. and Chip Heath I'm rereading it again yeah I read it so I might have some things to bring back from that so but this week's challenge is I am choosing to be a little bit more aware right now okay. and this was kind of copying off of Tom he has adjusted his meetings when he can to be 50 minutes mm. instead of an hour yeah. because everybody needs that buffer right and, and running to the next meeting and then it's all the other person's waiting yes two minutes exactly and and just giving yourself that so that's my challenge is to adjust my meeting times when appropriate and when I can control the schedule to make sure that I have transition time in between meetings mm-hmm. so that I am walking into the next meeting prepared in the way that I should be, that I take care of myself, maybe drink some water every once in a while, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's my challenge is change your meeting times where you can. So are you actually putting that in your calendar at 50 minutes? Okay. To make it easy, you could also just every time you start a meeting, you say, just so you know, this is a 50 minute meeting and you know, 10 10 before or whatever. Right. Right. But no, I'm I'm, I'm, just putting it in there. Yeah. It's really good because how many times do you start three minutes late because somebody had to go to the bathroom or whatever? Yep. Grab coffee. Whatever. I think that's so it. There's nothing like the clock strikes, you know, zero and getting started. Yeah. Yep. 
you're prepared mentally i think mm-hmm. that the meeting efficiency just goes way up yeah well and that's part of it too is not just adjust it to 50 minutes or something adjust the meeting time for how long it should actually take some it should be a 30 minute meeting yeah some could be 20 yeah. some could be 37 minutes yeah you know it, whatever it actually is and tying that back to eos which i'm obsessed with and do all the time is become better predictors yeah so that predicting is knowing how long something's going to take and making sure that you're accurately addressing that time frame right are you are you predicting well on your time yeah well one of the things that i'll just quickly say eos Mm -hmm. got me into the habit of was creating an agenda Yes. Meeting, yeah. Which is just, you know, this concept of actually planning your time. <laughs> but if you have five distinct sections of a meeting, mm-hmm. literally putting a time limit yes. to each. Yeah. And it just sticking with it. It just it does. Mm-hmm. If you write it down mm-hmm. and you're like, I have five minutes to get through this section, mm-hmm. you're gonna get through it in five minutes. Yep. Most of the time. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I have five minutes to get through this section. Mm-hmm. You're going to get through it in five minutes. Yep. More than you won't. That's a great way to say it. Without an agenda. Yeah. Yep. So that's good. That's the challenge. I'm going to be starting a book this week, The Gift of Failure. Oh, see, look at that. Yeah. All ties together. Yeah. So just wanted to let you know. Ooh, I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that yeah. one, too. Yeah, I'll give it to you afterwards. All right. Okay. That's that it. That wraps up another week of the podcast. See you have next week. Have a great week. week. Yep.